Lisa and Janelle Iglesias. Um, I'll read their bio here. So uh, Las Hermanas Iglesias is a project-based collaboration by two sisters, which incorporates a variety of relationships and structures for collectivity. Lisa Iglesias grounds her individual practice in drawing and painting across a variety of materials and processes. Janelle Iglesias works with and through objects to create sculpture and installation. Las Hermanas speaks to their identities as woven into histories and philosophies of feminism and collaboration. As the children of Norwegian and Dominican immigrants who grew up in Queens, New York City, their project-based transdisciplinary work explores issues of hybridity, social participation, and transnational identities. Their collective has fluidly evolved to include a number of team efforts and variations, including steady collaborations with their mother, Bodil, through employing playful structures that respond to the community and geographical context of each project, Las Hermanas Iglesias creates artworks that disrupt borders, engage absurdity, and promote the benefits of working together. So I want to give them a warm welcome for us here at Ball State. Um, I was very lucky to have actually met them in Qatar. We were talking about it a little earlier, our memories of the desert. And um, I still have actually also the Resograph book that you made of, of palindromes. Uh, and I have kept that as just a reminder of your playful spirit. And I was really impressed by your warmth, uh, both as people and also as artists. So I am just so excited to have you here and that uh, Lisa will also be working with the drawing students on Monday in narrative drawing. So with that, I'll give it to you. Thank you so okay. much, Rachel. Okay. We're so happy to be here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and as Janelle mentioned, this is such a beautiful opportunity to be with like, a, we're in an intimate group. So if you want to have, you know, you can put your questions into the chat, you can put your questions into the YouTube function, and then we can as a group kind of react to anything that comes up. Um, so thank you so much, Rachel. It's so wonderful to be here and thank you, Ball State. Um, Janelle and I are really excited to join you. And here we put in our little handle and website and Janelle put the website into the chat. If you would like to see some examples of our work that kind of extend beyond the, the presentation. Um, Janelle and I are not necessarily gonna focus on our individual practices today. Uh, we're, going to sh we're going to focus on our collaborative uh, projects. So if you're curious what we do individually, check out the website. And um, Janelle is going to start out with a land acknowledgement for San Diego. So I am, so I am uh, my name is Janelle Iglesias. I use she, her, her pronouns. And I'm zooming in from San Diego, California, which is the unceded territory of the Kumeyaay Nation. And I'm Lisa. I use she, her pronouns. And I'm joining you from South Hadley, Massachusetts, located on the traditional homelands of the Nipmuc and the Pecumtuck. Um, and we're so, it's one of the reasons we're so excited to be here with you is because we are, we are coming to you from these different spaces. Um, and that Janelle and I are coming to you from like these pedagogical contexts, which brought us to those places, right? And so we're really excited to meet with fellow educators and fellow artists and students, uh, because we that's a really big part of our identity as well, um, our educators, right? Yeah. So Lisa and I have been collaborating for the past uh, about 15 years under the moniker Las Hermanas Iglesias. Um, we are the youngest of four daughters and, um, you know, growing up and we grew up in Queens, New York, uh, growing up, we were always kind of associated, um, as Lisa and Janelle, we're not twins. We're about, uh, 14 months apart. And so, uh, we really grew up in this way of being sort of treated as a duo and really always thought about ourselves in relation um, to each other and in relation to our family very much so. So when naming our collaboration, it was really organic um, that we chose this name Las Hermanas because embedded in it was this idea of collaboration, this idea of relationality and this idea of sisterhood. Multiplicity, collectivity, and um, this idea that, as Janelle mentioned, this relativity to each other, to our to our family members, um, to our borough, um, and that that this sort of collaboration that Janelle and I kind of 
officially began in 2005 also you know Nick goes back to when we were very like babies and collaborating and working like working through and with um, all of the kind of challenges that it comes to being daughters to that it comes with uh, being siblings um, and so this uh, mm -hmm. you go. Oh yeah, one of the things I think this this drawing from 1982, uh, when I was two years old and Lisa was three years old, um, illustrates is that I think a lot of people often um, kind of romanticize the idea of working with your sibling, and uh, it is pretty romantic. We both feel very lucky, in, in terms of just. Um, having the kind of uh, grace of having somebody that you're so close to being able to work with them. But there's also all of the familial tensions um, that you have only with your siblings and only with people that are that are you're that close with that you have to contend with as well. Um, and so I think uh, when we found this this drawing in the kind of family archive, we couldn't stop laughing because there's there's sort of this um, this shade uh, thrown with the, the pen marks are from my sister Janelle and the fact that sister is spelled wrong as well. Um, it's, it's pretty lovely. I think it also speaks to a continual back and forth, a kind of dialogic process of, of um, working on each other's work, quote unquote, and kind of blurring the eyes, um, blurring lines of authorship and getting, um, getting comfortable with being uncomfortable is something that we're really interested in. So Janelle and I often root a lot of our decision making, a lot of how we ground our projects and how we contextualize ourselves like through, of course, this lineage of parentage, our experience um, being second generation growing up in Queens, as Janelle mentioned, and that our parents had these very specific experiences of immigration, our mother growing up in a very, very rural part of Norway, um, and our father growing up in an extremely urbanized environment in the Dominican Republic in the capital in Santo Domingo. And then they eventually moved as adult, like they settled as adults in Queens where they met each other and had kids, which is then how we like came about. And, um, and we trace that kind of um, distance, the, the prevalence of um, like a multilingual presence, um, sort of abilities and dissonances and in inabilities to translate language. All of those things were huge factors as we were growing up and continue to factor into our work. Um, this is one of our really early works um, that Janelle and I created together during graduate school. So, so either at a similar time frame as some of you, or um, a little not so far off from where you, um, all of you are studying right now. Um, for those of you who are students, and I, these works would start out with one of us putting marks on a piece of paper, either through a physical material like masking tape in the upper left, or tracing shadow. As you can see on the on the right hand side, those two that are on top of each other are, are traced shadows, or like putting the the paper through a sewing um, with a sewing machine and, and tracing someone else's marks. So we would start out this prompt and mail it to each other. Janelle was living at the time in Virginia, and I was living at the time in Florida, and we just as Janelle mentioned, this kind of dialogic call and response conversation, this layering of mark making, is how we started out again as. Um, as, more, as somewhat more of adults um, in 2005, sending these back and forth through the mail. And um, just even speaking to the power of what a, what, what a faculty member can do in terms of connecting people to different communities and such is that at that time we weren't showing them really to anyone, but eventually we did show them to um, one of my professors at UF uh, Ron Janowicz, who then curated two of these collaborative drawings into a show about collaboration with Will Pappenheimer um, and in, in New York City. So that was like our first show and our first need to have a name for what we were doing kind of intuitively, and then it became much more official. And this is a practice, this kind of going back and forth, um, sending things through the mail, but also taking this, this box of paper, of works on paper out and continuing to um, kind of have this visual conversation with those works on paper. It's something that we've continued throughout our practice as a kind of grounding strategy, as sometimes a way to brainstorm or to think through things um, or get started uh, if we haven't seen each other in a while and in a while to break the ice, um, but also to keep 
keep some keep a thread going um, throughout our practice as well. So this is something that I I'm I'm and Lisa and I are still doing to this day is is sending these works on paper back and forth, and they continue to change alongside um, the work that we're making in our own studios individually, as well as the work that we're making collaboratively. Um, and so that's been a really fun thing to see is is a kind of um, visual conversation that's changing over time and the way that palettes are changing and strategies are changing. Oftentimes these pieces of paper get um, repainted over and over and over uh, so that we don't necessarily think of them as finished objects, um, but that they're shown in whatever state they happen to be in when we're making them. There's no rules and so they can be cut up and recollaged or cut through or reassembled. And this is also a strategy that we've used with other different kinds of um, projects and techniques that we've kind of applied that improv improvisational practice towards other times when we've come together to make a body of work. So this was a body of work that we made while in Qatar when we met Rachel, which we wanted to, um, which we wanted to show, where we um, both worked on a series of screen prints that were, um, where the whole series was completely variable. And uh, we just kept adding and um, taking away and cutting through um, on these screen prints. And so the backside and the front side, um, so often the backside had a, a full color that was printed on it so that when we cut through a shape and perhaps folded it over, you got this, um, this additional visual mark as well. Um, and sometimes we would put another print behind them so that they would be this kind of layering of prints. Um, and layering of materials. We were also um, using the laser cutter to cut through plexi and also using some of these plexiglass parts that came out um, as, as um, shapes that we would run through the press. And so we were kind of taking all of these different shapes and um, creating this kind of visual language um, or conversation that was um, morphing and changing with each print. And I, I think part of that too is this idea that like Janelle mentioned, you could see the front side and the back side that it, it really privileged a multiplicity of perspective and viewpoints. So in many of our works, we're trying to, yes, blur the boundaries between is, is this a 2D, 2D work? Is it three dimensional? Um, is it a print? Is Can we make the, can we turn the print into a variable unique um, then, then do some hand painting and paper cutting on, and then add plexi. So we like to kind of blur around the these categories. Um, and also like this idea of translation that one mark can then be uh, kind of filtered through a process so that it turns into something else. And as Rachel mentioned, we work very closely with our mom, uh, Boathild, and that part of our uh, collaborative structure is super important to us. This is an example where we curate from this kind of like stack of works on paper that we've collected and we'll curate from them and talk with our mom about how to transform them into textile pieces. And that happens in a variety of different ways that we'll talk about um, a little bit later in the presentation, but this is kind of linking the textile works right away to these visual conversations um, on paper and canvas. And that particular piece that you saw on the right is now here as in a painting that has a hinge on it. So then again, like talking about it does it goes beyond this idea of it being a static uh, painting. It's not a tapestry. It's not a it's not a knit. It's it's not a painting like these things can be have a multiplicity of identities um, and that that kind of uh, main that that kind of ethos comes up again and again in our projects. So we're really interested in resisting these like very strict definitions of how something operates and also really, really interested in ways in which the viewer can become kind of implicated in, um, in viewing the work and experiencing the work. And so um, one has to be curious enough to try to open the painting to find these small sculptures that are underneath. Um, we've also uh, um, been um, experimenting with making uh, work with Lisa's son, Bowie, who uh, is, is eight years old right now. I think the work um, that we made in this particular show often had small sculptures um, that he made when he was about six um, that were hiding in different places in the gallery. And so this um, body of work, we were also kind of referring to things that were going on in our in our personal lives and in our um, kind of uh, subconscious. And one of those things was playing a lot of hide and go seek at the time and this kind of joy of looking and finding things. And connected with this that kind of material idea of where there's doesn't need to be this strict binary between one thing, one definition and another. I think that some of our earliest ways of how Janelle and I were 
collaborating on um, alongside those works on paper are these very early works where we were blurring the boundaries of where she and I began and ended so that we would braid our hair together. We, one, of our, one of the earliest times that we collaborated with our mother was to ask that she knit us a conjoined dress that we would wear um, and, and fusing our nails together. So these, these, these kind of gestures and these uh, wearable sculptures and like um, suggestions of performative potential, um, we're, we're questioning our our uh, the boundaries between who we were um, as individuals. I think we also always saw Las Hermanas as this kind of sculptable entity, um, as a kind of uh, the idea of collaboration being central to our practice, that we could experiment with what being a collaborative team means and what working together means. Um, and so uh, that might be, you know, implicating ourselves in the work. It might mean uh, taking turns. It might mean something kind of dialogic or one person captaining um, a decision-making process at, at, you know, at, um, at, on each time. Um, but it's always, I feel like, something that we're not necessarily taking for granted or setting as a default, but we're questioning how we're going to come to a collab um, collaboration and, and what kind of what um, what form a project will take and kind of I, uh, making a map for ourselves about what we want to get out of the project and how we want to approach the project as a team. This is one of those projects that um, is an example of, of certain decisions and certain uh, fabrication we did individually. Like it was important to us that Janelle make a self-portrait of herself and I make a self-portrait of myself using the form of the pinata. And then that we have a, this, we, we agreed on this structure where that Janelle would beat up my pinata and I would in turn beat up her pinata. Um, so said, sometimes we set up these rules or these kind of like wait, this this sort of logic that would make that makes sense for us for whatever reason at the time like it's contextual for each project, and in this one of course it was very important that we that the candies that are traditionally found in pinatas would be red and suggestive of viscera. Um, and it's one of these projects that I think really foregrounds that we like for things to be touched and taken away and dwindled and full of flux and shifting characteristics and that the audience can, you know, be involved in that kind of work. Um, and of course, shout out to Felix Gonzalez Torres. And this, that's also like a playful nod to the candy spills um, by one of our favorite artists. Uh, this is a project called Everybody Likes to Dance and um, was one of our early collaborative practices where we're also really thinking through our family history and thinking through ways that we identify very much as being from Queens, New York, which is this extremely diverse um, place in, in, in New York City, one of the most um, diverse you know, cities in the, in the country, albeit the world. And so this was a piece that uh, we made for the Queens Museum the first time that it was produced. And um, we asked our mom to, and our dad to come up with a song that they uh, really identified with dancing when they were younger. Um, and our mom chose uh, a pulse, which is a little bit like a polka, and is played with a fiddle. And our father chose a merengue. Um, and so from each of their countries, they chose this Norwegian pulse, this Dominican merengue. And then we worked with five musicians and um, asked them to create a mashup of these two different songs. There were no other instructions given. And so it could be something very seamless and danceable, or it could be something that sounded much more like sound art that was discordant and much um, could be super long. It didn't have to fit on a, like a sort of, you know, normal um, three or four or five minute uh, song track. Um, there were no kind of rules established. And so one of the things we we're interested in and in seeing what would happen and letting go a little bit and, and also not necessarily wanting to romanticize this idea of, of a mashup or of this kind of hybridity, but really um, looking at all the different ways that this could happen. And we also learned the dance steps for both of those dances in this project and created a dance diagram of a kind of mashup dance um, that implicated both steps um, and, and put them together in our own um, kind of new, new form of the dance. And so this is a hand painted uh, painting, but it's on the floor, so it also acts as a dance floor. And viewers are um, invited to take off their shoes 
and perform this dance diagram, this dance, and the music is playing in the space, and there are these kind of um, hybrid uh, disco balls that play above, and Lisa's going to play a little bit from one of the mashups by um, a collaborator named Chris Gorris. So you can hear the Norwegian fiddle playing um, and also um, the lyrics from um, Baile con Pedro Juan, which is the Dominican merengue um, in there as well. And this was uh, this um, kind of dance diagram is also a nod, like Lisa was talking about, with that um, kind of nod to Felix Gonzalez Torres with the pinatas. This dance diagram is a nod to Andy Warhol's early screen prints, um, which were of the foxtrot and different kinds of um, ballroom dances um, that were famously um, also displayed on the floor. And so, um, oftentimes, our work has these kind of con you know um, layers of contextual information and references, and sometimes you might get it and sometimes not um, and there's been but we're, we're excited that it's in there for those who are curious or interested and the um, this project also has a takeaway poster um, that is a the dance diagram and so you can take it home and learn the choreography um, yourself as well with another nod to Felix Gonzalez Torres with his takeaways for sure um, and a big part of that project of course were these disco balls that you know and I customized um, to uh, com to combine the, the mutual color palettes of Norway, the United States, and the Dominican Republic, as well as some of the language um, of, of the, these, three, th these, these three countries onto um, the disco balls that would spin above. And continuing this conversation around hybridity, um, these are a pair of Adidas Superstar sneakers who were made famous by Run DMC, um, who are also kind of famous within our particular neighborhood of Queens, New York, and Hollis, Hollis, Queens, um, shout out. And so this was a piece where we took these Adidas Superstar sneakers and we customized them with um, kind of a uh, very traditional Rusimaling uh, folk kind of painting, Norwegian painting, as well as these kind of nationalistic um, motifs from the Dominican Republic and the Dominican flag on top of those mashed together. And there's also these kind of diamond studded um, soles. And that's also a reference to um, uh, kind of diamonds on the sole of your shoes, which is a um, uh, Paul Simon, Art Gar Garfunkel song, who are also from Queens. And so thinking about these different kinds of references and mixing up our own kind of personal iconography into that. And on that end, the, that Bacalao and Clipfisk are these, um, this material, this animal, this kind of his, this history that re really embodies what Janelle was just saying. Um, in that clip fisk is salted cod uh, that is off that is fished off in northern Norway, and that uh, this this food this food stuff that has like a very 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 long shelf life and was able to be brought on ships uh, during colonialism um, that the conquistadors brought to. Uh, the global south, which then became this really popular food, bacalao, and is very much like considered one of the national foods of the Dominican Republic and in, in other uh, communities as well. And so this kind this this fish that connects Norway and the Dominican Republic, we're interested in that kind of continuity, that kind of synchronicity between these two disparate geographies. And then how, you know, food is such a large part of how we find ourselves embedded in culture and how we find ourselves connected to culture and also as a like an oral historical, like an oral history 
as a continuum connecting you with your four with your forebears. Um, and so we talked with our mom about recipes that she learned from our abuela in Dominican Republic about how to make rice and beans, um, but and also like how to make panakak and like Norwegian foods, and then a few ideas about how to combine these foods together. Um, and so this is another kind of example of a takeaway poster that foregrounds this sort of hybridity. Um, so before we get to this next uh, kind of group of works, I want to just want to go back to the chat and read out some questions um, or kind of weave through some answers. And so um, Natalie asks, I noticed many of the gallery picks have different seating or objects on the gallery floor. I think Natalie maybe is referencing to a link in the chat to a show um, to, 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 um, to our website, to some of those pictures on the website. Um, it's how visitors interact with the gallery space factored in while you initially construct your work, or is it an aspect that becomes important later when the work is finished and ready to be installed. And I think that probably depends on which project. And so something like Every Life to Dance, you know, we're designing this dance floor to be participatory. Um, something like the hinged paintings, we're also designing to be participatory. And when we were thinking about how we can add in seating, um, that was also thinking about how people could get comfy and have a different experience, um, possibly like moving them around. We also had an audio tour in that exhibition. And so we wanted some place where people would be comfortable enough to sit and listen to the whole audio tour rather than just sort of like walking in the gallery and leaving. Um, and so I would say that that's, that's pretty contextual um, for each show or each project, but it's something that we always are kind of questioning in terms of how are, is the work accessible to people and how can people participate in the work depending on the space, um, the limitations of the space, the limitations of um, the context um, as well. And so right now uh, we did it, we have done projects where everything in the space is movable and you can interact and, and um, create and play with, um, and you can actually check out the space to, to like hold a you know a music video or a birthday party or an activist meetup or a professor could check out the space to hold a class um, but we've also had straight gallery shows in museums where the the um the kind of um uh you know, culture of that space was not to touch anything. And we were asked to kind of respect that in terms of what, how the space ran and what they were able to do in terms of how they staff and monitor the space as well. Um, we also had a question regarding, um, Emily asks on your uh, gallery pictures and in the pieces we're looking at, a lot of your pieces are very 3D and incorporate plenty of textures and colors. I was curious about your process in creating these pieces was like, because it's a lot more of a physical process. And Lisa, Lisa do you want to talk a little bit about the hand in our work? Yeah, I think Janelle and I are really interested in being transparent and honest about the presence of the of the jazz hands, but the presence of the hands like that you can tell when looking at most of our work how it was made for well, one because there's not we're not necessarily interested in this sort of um, this guise of expertise that we're very much okay with this idea that we're constantly learning new things and learning how to make these things and we're often working in, you know, Janelle and I live on different coasts and we have been for a while. And so sometimes when we work together, we're working at our, you know, at our mom's house in Queens on the kitchen table or in the, or in the garage. And that all of, all of these considerations are present in the work. And so there's that, um, that sort of surface availability for the viewer to see how something was done, right? And so leaving sort of like a breadcrumb trail that the technique, the gesture, like how something was made um, reveals its own layer of material meaning, of, of uh, relational meaning. Um, and that, uh, that going back to that idea of authorship, like you can tell that multiple things have been done, but it doesn't really matter who does what is also interesting to us to play with. Um, and that Janelle, you know, it's a lot of it, a lot of our work together is very playful. And so the, the material that we're working with, most of the material we're working with, whether it's a photograph or a, um, a video or um, a sculpture or a drawing, we're not, not, we're not interested in these things being like fixed um, static objects that we're very interested in like the living condition and how they might, how these objects might morph. And so oftentimes that winds up uh, revealing a lot of sculptural or physical interventions, I suppose. Yeah. And that's a, that's a really nice tie into Jose's question, uh, which material has the most complexity when making an art piece? And I think that we're 
continually trying new materials and different strategies. Um, and sometimes there's an ease and sometimes there's a stumble as well. Sometimes there's a kind of dance and a learning curve. Um, and sometimes we're teaching each other things. Some one of us might be um, familiar with the process and much more than the other one. And um, or somebody that we're collaborating with might be captaining that part of a process as well. Um, and so, yeah, I think one of the things we enjoy about our collaboration is that we're always up for learning new things and trying things and challenging ourselves. Um, this next project that uh, is on the screen that you're looking at is a performance piece. And so we we also work in performance. Uh, our mom was asked, we asked our mom to be the umpire for this um, piece called Competitions. And there was a question that really led into this so beautifully. And um, the question was regarding, uh, um, somebody asked, I've considered collaborating with my sister and I'm wondering how you manage to collaborate equally without getting super competitive. Um, so this series came out of, a, um, uh, you know, this idea about, uh, one, one being this idea of sibling rivalry and, you know, being competitive when, with one sibling and also the joy of the competitions that we had, um, with each other growing up, we would also often compete with each other as a game. So who could do something for longer, um, and we would just, you know, make up things on the spot with whatever we would to, to amuse ourselves. But we'd also like sort of see if we could, how long we could do something together. And so, so, so sometimes where our competitions were, were, were sort of against ourselves with a high score um, as well. And, um, you know, I think um, more so than being, we, while we may be a bit competitive with each other, I think that was sort of on the surface. I think we've always been super supportive of each other. Um, when it comes down to it. And so um, I think that maybe one of the ways that we got, um, we kind of dug into this idea of being competitive was when our collaborative work maybe sometimes started stepping on the toes of our individual practice, when something that we were doing in our individual works um, became very similar to something that we suggested doing as a collaborative team. And when we got uncomfortable with those kinds of having these, uh, you know, maybe we started feeling a little bit possessive about something that was going on in our own studio, we realized like, well, maybe we should just if that's something that we're, you know, that's, that's uncomfortable, maybe we should dig into that instead of avoid it. And so there, we will show um, some work where we start taking our individual practices and really collapsing it on top of each other and taking out this idea of authorship. And so I could start something and Lisa could finish it. We could pass it back and forth multiple times, but it initiated from our individual um, studios rather than coming together and working collaboratively on purpose, quote unquote. Um, and so, th so in these performance pieces, uh, we're kind of making fun of this idea of a competition and being competitive as siblings. And uh, our mom is holding up the sign that says round one, there's no bad weather, there's only bad clothing, which is a very common Norwegian saying. And um, the, the contest here is to strip down to our long underwear as fast as we can. And we're wearing um, like kind of equal amounts of clothing that was all, um, you know, kind of found in our mom's uh, house in Queens where we were staying at the time. Um, this is a show in New York. And so we raided her kind of closet and storage of winter clothes and winter gear. And we have equal amounts of clothing on. And you'll notice that, in, and on, to add to that, where nothing is ever thrown away, or at least it, when we were growing up, you know, no, nothing is ever thrown away. Everything is mended. And that these are resources, like that this winter clothing, for example, you can see there's a range of, of items that are either handmade, like we are, Janelle and I are wearing matching knit hats, which again speaks to Janelle and I having a sh very many overlapping shared experiences and even outfits. Um, and some of these, that some of this stuff is from like the early eighties and some of it um, might be a little bit, might be a little bit newer. And as Janelle mentioned, it was a very unattractive um, uh, strip tease in a way um, going. And then it, it led into these other kind of sequence of competitions. And so I, I really like you know, how you were responding to this idea about like just engaging deeply with that competition. So like bringing it up and talking about it and not um, assuming that every, that it that that sort of feel that those feelings don't exist, but rather just treating it head on and treating it as a plastic material that's interesting and that we can talk about and and um, and play with. And so in this and this was also the first time we had done a live performance. Jadelle and I consider much of the work that we do very performative, but oftentimes it was documented 
either in a video or through through very DIY photography. And this is was one of the first times we were requested to do it live. And at first we were very, hes well, we were very hesitant at first and then decided to, to again, try it out. Like that same ethos of like, let's, let's try the, let's try new things and let's just constantly be novices. Um, and so that some of these antics would reference um, like double dare or um, like beauty pageants or, um, you know, these sorts of like ridiculous levels of competition. And maybe, and this is one of those, like, maybe one of the pieces, right, where there's kind of seating that's integrated into the show, these bean bags, and you'll, you'll notice later on in the presentation where um, this pattern on the bean bag is a, is a translation of a work on, of a painting on a work on paper. So we're also just interested, like what happens when, when a pattern or a gesture or a material consideration is filtered through almost like when you, when, you know, when you translate, when you play the game of telephone and when you try to do something in different sites, sorts of ways, the meaning changes and also how to, how to, how to engage the, the viewer and how to make the, as Janelle mentioned, an experience more accessible and more comfortable. And many times when it's just not like, um, you know, show exhibitions where there's no seating at all. Um, and not that, the, you know, that these seats are very low to the ground and that's not going to be accessible for everyone, but also having shows where we've made plinths and desks and kind of interactive furniture, which um, could be touched and um, sat on in a variety of ways. And you can see here the drawings on the right. Um, here is a kind of close up of these, which we think of these also as like found objects, right, Janelle? Like these um, shell, shells, for example. Yeah, so the, the, the shells are, um, are collaged from Xeroxes and books and magazines, and they're on top of uh, flash and gouache uh, works on paper that similarly are this kind of back and forth patterning that we have been working on in the studio as well. Um, and so they, they, the one on the, on the far right has a magnifying glass uh, or magnifying lens, I should say, um, kind of in front of it as well. And so it becomes also more sculptural um, but we're we're also really interested in this idea of like what's in the front versus what's in the background um, and then kind of mixing up uh, many different ways of making things. Um, and so um, the work on the screen right now is another one of those hinged paintings. Um, it's also, you know, again, not a square. It's more of like a strange doorway, perhaps with these kind of found objects behind it. And it's actually um, uh, a drop cloth that we used during the making of the other work in the show and then repainted back into as well to kind of finish it as a painting in, in its own right. Uh, the work in this show uh, was was made when we were kind of mining um, our childhood home in Queens after our father died and we came back home to help clean it out. And so uh, we kind of went through a lot of the things that we were getting rid of in the house and decided that they were going to come become material for um, for for sculptures and for wall works um, and to, to kind of play with those things that were really banal, um, sometimes had really like negative or boring or kind of stupid almost kind commentations in terms of like our own personal references to them to see how they could um, how they could change and become something totally different. And in many of the ways that I'm that you have these conversations uh, with each other with your with your professors this idea of a charge of a material and think and knowing or just really believing this idea that these TV dinner trays that Janelle, grow, that Janelle and I grew up with that they carry this history and this resonance and this patina of use um, and interaction and pop culture and like all of that stuff. And that that can be like Janelle used that word mining, like that could be mined and become embodied and transformed into this work when it's combined with other ephemera and with other sorts of little bits and pieces that we collage together in sculptural ways. And so this is a sculpture that um, has like medical equipment and old furniture parts and things we found on the street, um, things that were found in that house. Um, and, and it has things that we both consider, you know, kind of 
um, like uh, like a conch shell or this kind of uh, this 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 salt lamp, these kind of beautiful natural organic objects and these really man made things as well. Um, and so, kind of one of the things and that we're interested in is this you know this conversation of our hands we talked about. So these are casts of our actual hands um, with silly putty be stretched between them. Um, and we're also really interested in this you know this dialogue between all of these materials, things that are found, things that are um, found and then repurposed or activated in some kind of way, things that are casts of things that already exist. Um, so there's a play between objects in the installation oftentimes of what's real, what's made, um, what's, a, what's a sort of fake, a quote unquote, um, and, and um, all of these different languages of things that are handcrafted or, or based on a sort of um, particular tradition or things that are hacked together or jerry-rigged as well. And one of the things we're also interested in the ways in which the sculpture is very much a drawing in space as much as it's a sculpture. And the work that you see leaning against the wall is a sort of flat work that operates as a painting, but it also operates as a sculpture as well. It's a, a great segue into this show, Resistors, where we use that image as the poster. Um, also that the title I think is really indicative and embodies uh, this practice that Chanel and I really try to repeat over and over again in terms of being playful with language. And that uh, these double entendres or these opportunities for language to function in different ways simultaneously. Um, we often try to resort to that, those sorts of techniques um, in the titles or in a takeaway poster, like in this, no, it is opposition within this that kind of palindromic um, capacity, like the, the risograph zine that Rachel mentioned earlier. Um, and so this is kind of, these are this is a kind of collage of scenes from this show resistors at ASU um, where yellow was a huge unifying color palette sometimes like when something like color comes up, for example right Janelle and I will have conversations about the metaphorical um, and material associations of what color we might want to really dive into and that oftentimes guides us into how we make decisions. And uh, as part of the show, we were doing a residency where we got to make work um, in the gallery before um, people were invited to come and see it as an exhibition. And so um, we did bring some work with us, but a lot of the work that we created was on site. And we were given um, kind of access to things that the museum was going to throw away. And one of the things we're interested in is, is looking at the ways in which um, gallery walls could sort of function as sculptural apparatuses in themselves rather than disappearing as a kind of neutral space. Um, this show is in 2017. And so it was also in Arizona. And so this idea of the wall with a capital W was very much in the news and very much on people's minds. And this idea of um, resisting in terms of resisting dominant uh, cultural ideas in terms of thinking about, um, you know, how folks can resist um, in different kinds of ways. And so um, while this is a sculpture, it also kind of feels performative in ways in which we're trying to cut through this wall or, um, you know, in, in, in gestures of our of cast, our, our hands are cast and sort of holding out um, ropes or throwing things or punching through or raising a fist in solidarity um, within and through the wall itself. And there are moments when you can see through the wall so that the wall can be penetrable and we took a sawzall and we cut through and made kind of we burrowed through the wall so that it's completely porous and it sort of also provided these frames to view different parts of the exhibition through these windows that we would either insert um, sunglass um, lenses into or um, two-way mirrors or open cutouts where you could see little vignettes that were happening inside the wall, including for more casts of our hands, like in this instance, holding onto a grapefruit, like in, in talking about, like as Janelle mentioned, this, this kind of art historical reference. So this would reference Yoko Ono's grapefruit and that, idea, that book really emblematizing this idea of, um, of collaboration and kind of collective responses to prompts. So that kind of happened playfully throughout the entire show. Um, and, and also that, the, that these are further examples like with this work um, where we take, as Janelle you know, put it, like these kind of banal or like everyday kind of um, objects, like in this case, the armature of a, of a pop-up tent and then reconsider its use or misuse it 
or um, kind of flip it on its head to reconsider it in a different kind of way. And that on, on, the, on the peaks of these little armature uh, pyramidal shapes, um, there are these little sculptures that we would make together. And with um, sometimes like, I, I think that Bowie also collaborated on some of these kind of lumpy sculptures as well. And that the show, here is some of the, um, here's some screen prints like from that risograph um, that we made um, in, um, in Doha, Qatar with VCUQ, where we met Rachel, um, some of these, some of that work uh, translated then into these takeaway posters um, that were available that we switched out. So like, I think that it was each week or I don't remember Janelle, I think it was each week that we put a different poster out. Um, and this, again, like that kind of verbiage of your sister will take her turn now is can be seen as both playful as well as a call to action and um i janelle and i often return to this quote i'm gonna mess it up though janelle like the francis elise quote do you do doing things uh sometimes doing something poetic can be political sometimes doing something political can be poetic i think is the gist of it i'm not saying that exactly but it's a yeah, yeah, and I think that it like we in terms of these overlap this Venn diagram of joyfulness and playfulness and activism and um, advocacy for commute for communities and being in within communities. Um, I think Janelle and I are constantly centering and trying to learn how to do that better. Um, and that some of our projects carry that um, carry that kind of poetry more indirectly or directly than others. And this, um, this space had this beautiful hallway with all of these niches um, that had a glass brick that let natural light into, um, into the gallery space. So you walk through this kind of hallway and on the left, you can see all of these little niches. Um, and on the right, what you're looking at is a workshop that we did before the, um, uh, for the kind of opening of the show in which um, we worked with kids and we asked them if they would put on a blindfold and the piece is called Unseen Futures. And it's asking them to envision what they wanna bring into to their future, what they want the future to hold, and to think about that while blindfolded and to make an object. Um, and so they made these small glass, I'm um, sorry, sorry, small clay objects that were placed inside these niches um, that had these glass bricks. And so the, the light shines through and kind of illuminates each of these objects. And so um, you could go and kind of look at each, each individual one, but the, the work was really about this kind of collective um, idea of all of us having these ideas about what we want to see in our future. And um, uh, and it, it basically frames the, the, the exhibition and as you walk in. And so kids could also return and find their sculpture later if they wanted to, they lasted and they, they um, stayed in the niches for the length of the exhibition. And so sometimes these are methods that we also use as kind of like crowdsourcing or participatory interventions where maybe you can't touch or participate during the whole length of the show, but maybe there are certain events or workshops that happen in conjunction with an exhibition or with a project. And with that said, like the, so those kind of, again, bring it back to the takeaway poster and this kind of participatory thing, the way that we think of like those openings in that hallway accumulate and kind of grow and change in terms of like these objects collecting and uh, creating that framing of the show. We're, we really are super interested in this idea of the takeaway poster as being this sculpture that, 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 that dwindles, that changes shape. Um, that not only can a viewer take something away for free, and that also that the object has a life beyond this kind of gallery context, and that it goes and lives somewhere else, but also that the sculpture itself changes size, which is fun. <laughs> and that that sculpture, you can see that this takeaway poster is then reconsidered in a different way, just as like we consider other like works on paper or sculptural materials, like you'll notice perhaps that the pink jacket that is included in this sculpture on the right was located in a different sculpture earlier in the salt lamp as well. And that, that uh, the Won't Lovers Revolt Now poster was reconsidered in terms of color palette and then kind of used as almost like a paperweight for the weaving that's hanging on this sculpture at Brick in Brooklyn. And this sculpture has kind of um, found textiles that we dyed and altered and also this kind of sampler of weaving um, while we were this project was made while we were doing a textile residency with our mother. And it's a um, it's a woven textile used trying out all of these different patterns and yarns and seeing what would happen on the loom. 
um, as well. And so that idea of like that a project can provide an opportunity to learn again, that will come up again and again. And this idea of how one thing can turn into another and transform itself is also um, seen here where our works on paper are filtered through conversation, that we talk about it as a group, that we learn about different things and contribute different layers to then um, they become these knit paintings. So here's where you could see the reference to the beanbag, that that pattern exists in both a work on paper, a knit painting as we usually call them, and then as the beanbag. And that these works go back and forth, and sometimes we'll make a work on paper. It will turn and we'll transform it with our without with our mother into a knit painting, and then sometimes we'll go back to the original work on paper, or start or make another work on paper that then responds. So there's constantly like a call and response um, between these different practices. And I put a link in the chat to some um, some exhibitions um, that uh, really focus on this kind of uh, collaborative project with our mom, Bodhild. Um, and uh, what's on the screen now is we've been really thinking about um, how can we change up um, some of the formats and continue to expand this um, collaborative textile um, practice that we're developing with our mom. And so um, how can we break some of the rules that sort of, you know, the rules always kind of sneak up on you without even um, saying them out loud. You might have these kind of firm boundaries about what you're going to do. And then uh, once you make enough, enough work, you sort of realize, oh, we're kind of, we have this, this kind of way of doing things. How can we do something completely different or, or do the opposite of that? and um, what will change if we do that. And so these works are starting to include um, uh, new ways of our hands all coming together in a piece, um, different kinds of materiality and different kinds of textile techniques all within the same work as well. So in one work, there might be um, embroidery, there might be crochet, there might be different patterns of knitting, um, and then they all kind of come together in different sorts of ways. Janelle mentioned the Textile Arts Center residency that we were privileged to do with our mom. It's a really wonderful organization based in Brooklyn. Um, Janelle and I participated um, in, by distance, like I was in Florida and Janelle was in California and her mother was like the main physical participant and we would visit when we could and also communicate through these different structures that we're all very comfortable with now, like face, you know, video conferencing and text and just using all of those structures to collaborate as well. Um, and throughout and through that residency, we were able to learn and reinforce different techniques. And then it culminated in this exhibition where we brought together the rag rug that you can see that's on the floor and draped over a wooden armature is a rag rug that our mother's mother, our best mood made um, that are, is one of the very few materials that um, we have to represent her. And so our mother responded to the rag rug by making the knit painting in the upper left that's draped over the armature. And so there was a there was a negotiation of this like continuum of of knowledge of craft knowledge, but in a response to motherhood. Um, and with that, also we were really interested in responding to the patterns and teachings of Annie Albers. So there are many different patterns within the installation that speak to to Annie Albers as well as a sort of matriarch of, um, of Western textiles, for example. Within that um, installation was this takeaway poster. And then just to sort of finish up again, returning to this idea, I think of like playing constantly with structures for collaboration, that there's not just one way of doing it. You don't own, like in terms of like, I think many times when we were starting out, maybe we, Janelle and I had these false assumptions that the work had to be made in tandem, simultaneously, physically together. And now we're very interested in seeing what are all the ways that we can uh, challenge that rule, um, that illusion. And also these different structures for collaboration are again, opportunities to learn different things and to put all of our hands in the mix. Um, one of the things that we're also, you know, constantly interested in is how can we um, bring whatever's happening in our, in our personal and kind of, um, you know, in, in our kind of 
psychic life as well into the work, into in, in what's happening with ourselves and our families and, and embed that into the choices and decisions that we're making. Um, and so uh, for the past few exhibitions that we've had with our mom, we've also invited Lisa's son Bowie to create an audio tour of the works and the show where he talks a little bit about um, what he's looking at and, and also asks the, the listener different questions about them. And this came up also in terms of thinking about how you might encounter an exhibition, how much time you might spend with a work if you were listening to somebody talk about it. Um, if you couldn't see, what would your experience of the work be um, if it had an audio component, if you have a different level of vision as well. So thinking about access, um, thinking also about this idea of um, familial life being juicy and wonderful and not just necessarily rele relegated to something as a sort of distraction to more quote unquote serious work. Um, and so oftentimes we're really interested in bringing in something that's um, familial and personal into work that's shared publicly um, because we we want to value um, uh, you know our family life, our children, our, uh, our um, identities as daughters, our identities as mothers, our identities as educators, rather than sort of being um, a sort of um, slave to this archetype of the artist, which is usually male, which is usually, um, you know, a kind of soul genius, and is also usually self-destructive, isn't necessarily, um, you know, kind of somebody who's uh, well integrated into the social or activist fabric of a community. Um, it's sort of like a lone wolf, um, you know, and in, in, in sort of um, beating themselves up in the studio. And so we're really interested in creating a new model of what an art what it's like to be an artist in the world for ourselves um and lisa do you want to play a clip of uh bowie one of the um one of the tracks from one of the audio tours yeah sure so so, so some we've played around with different ways that we can do this sometimes there's a headset that's available for viewers sometimes there's a qr code uh so there's definitely different ways that we can try to make this audio available and um over the summer Bowie is um, up for creating a new uh, audio tour for the works that we're developing right now for the fall. Hello. Now it's time to look for the painting that looks like a zebra. What does it, close your eyes for 10 minutes. What does it smell like? What does it look like? I, I love your imagination. It's so good. Take a friend if you want to. Okay, now it's time to go, lovers. We're trying to go. And I do want to say that this, that his audio tours are unscripted. These are totally like his contribution and that we're also interested in that. Like, I think that through collaboration, there's oftentimes less control that um, even though Janelle and I may be control freaks in other aspects of our life, so to speak, um, we're also really interested in like seeing what happens when you take away the script and when you experiment and allow yourself to be surprised by, by the end result. I'm gonna um, stop my share now and we can open up, I think everything to like, a, let's, do a, let's do a conversation. And maybe we start with uh, there's a there's a question in the chat by Rachel J. What what's it like being individual women and then as a female duo in the art world? Um, that's a great question, and um, I think one of the reasons that Lisa and I really enjoy collaborating is the kind of courage and um, freedom that we feel from working together. That um, having a teammate makes some of the pressures or some of the um, like we we feel a little bit more um, less self conscious to do performances or to do things that are maybe outside of what we feel like are our um, and our own you know kind of personal individual um, bodies of work and in our collaborative practice um, I think early on we we kind of committed to it being completely free and and sort of open to doing anything and everything as long as we felt like it was productive and we were going to learn something from it. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, I think that, that one of the things we love about our duo is the kind of power that we feel, um, that we have in terms of supporting each other and, and our own commitment to trying new things, um, as a team. Lisa, do you want to say anything about that? 
Yeah, I think that that's one of the major um, privileges of working together is this shared, uh, this sort of buoyancy of courage that we can offer each other. Because I think in um, these institutional contexts, like whether it's academia, whether it's like quote unquote art world or the the sort of structure, the, the constructed ideas we have of what that's supposed to be, it can be very overwhelming um, and very intimidating for, uh, an, in, for an individual. For, not for everybody, but for, for me, for sure. And, um, and when I work with Janelle, I think that there's a different sense of a bravery that comes like, um, I, I don't give as much of a fuck and cause it's like, it can be much more funny. It can, the work can make less sense, um, in terms of like having a, uh, having this like linear narrative arc that wherever all the work is makes sense together in any package, like we can kind of do whatever we want. Um, and I think I feel less of that freedom when I'm, when I'm working individually in my studio, of course, there's other beautiful things of working individually, but I think that, um, that definitely like a sense of camaraderie and mutual reciprocity and support comes from, from working with Janelle. And I think that's something that's super lucky. I'm trying to see if there's other questions of the chat, but for, for yeah, sure, people can understand. unmute themselves. Ha, ha, ha. This is a funny, okay. So there's a, there's a great questions. So Anthony's question with the pandemic going on, how is, how has that affected creating work for you both? That's a great question. Um, I think, Janelle, you and I were already pretty, uh, we love, we love using the, U the United States Postal Service. I love getting new stamps. I love using the, um, you know, like the bulk rate packages. So Janelle and I are package mavens. Like we love sending each other a good care package. And there's like overlap with how we, how we collaborate. Like we'll send each other a care package that has cookies, but also has a sculptural part. Like I'm thinking of those hands, Janelle, that I sent oh, you. Yeah, that was a great, that was a great package. <laughs> so like we utilize the mail. We, we text each other and FaceTime and Zoom. We, we, we we're on Facebook and Instagram. Like we just try to use every single <laughs> structure either well or terribly. <laughs> yeah. I think and, one of the things that's challenging though is that we're used to being able to have these kind of work intensives with each other, whether mm -hmm. that be when we, when we physically arrive to install a show, if we have a large installation window, we usually try to take that as a way to kind of finish work on site together as almost as a residency um, or a sort of self-imposed residency where one of us goes to the other one's location and we'll have a kind of work intensive or a research intensive or a particular project that we're performing or photographing or or um, shooting, you know, that that we, we, we plan these things out. And so not having that ability to see each other, I think has been challenging um, and, and we definitely miss each other. And we've also uh, in our personal lives had a lot going on that we wanted to share with each other. I just had a baby um, four months ago and Lisa's due in a month and we haven't been able to be with each other um, throughout these pregnancies. So that's been, I think, more hard, honestly, than it has been to be apart in terms of the studio. But um, just like the studio practice, we also kind of, I always feel like uh, I have somebody in my corner and she's right there with me and I'm right there with her, even if we can't be together physically. And um, we've also made work about that, um, that kind of physical distance while trying to stay together um, through photographic works that we're collaging together um, during this time as well. Yeah, yeah, there's been a lot of, I mean, there's been a lot of uh, stress and sadness I, I think oftentimes when I'm talking with Janelle, it's like, I always, my go-to um, defense mechanism is like, try to make, try to be like playful and funny about it, but it's, it has sucked for sure. <laughs> and um, for lots of reasons, I mean, I think that there's so many layers of trauma that are circulating in the, in, within the past four, five, six years. Um, that the pand and that, that the pandemic is certainly a big part of, um, and that distancing from e from each other, yeah, that's it, it is really difficult, and I think that it um, maybe reinforces also the commitment to like let's figure out how to do it regardless. Maybe um, I like this question of which artwork did both of you agree was the least. Yeah. Favorite? That's such a good question. Nobody talks about the their quote unquote failures or things um, that that they didn't like that because I, I can definitely think of things that I've made on my own studio 
that I there are oftentimes things that Janelle hates that I really like. That's true. <laughs> That's really true. Sometimes we joke about um the fact that like uh one of the things that Lisa was talking about how you know we can kind of do whatever we want, but there's also two critics involved at the same time, too. And so there's double criticality. Um, and we both have different lenses that we're looking at things and when we're when we're trying to think if there's one that we agree on, because honestly, the first thing I think of is one we don't agree on. Janelle and I have this piece. Um, is it, oh, I can't remember what it's called right now, but we, we constructed this um, kind of uh, lumpy sculpture on top of a shaving mirror accordion, right? So that when it's installed on the wall, it can be moved in and out. And I like, like we, we inserted like this little mirror into it. And I think it's hilarious because to me, it like references surveillance. And it's also re reminds me of like the highly problematic and highly nostalgic movie Goonies where the um, the, the punching, the, the boxing glove comes out of his outfit. Um, and Janelle has, has you, sometimes you've been like, mm, no. <laughs> but I'm trying to think if there's one that we both agree we're like, mm, that failed. I don't know if we both agree on them. I can think of a couple that I've been like, oh, I really don't like that. I don't want to show it. And you've been like, I don't like that. We should show that work. I think you're, yeah, maybe you're more. I think I'm, I'm more honestly more of the naysayer. I have to. Or we could put it as you're the more astute critic. And I'm like, yeah, it's funny. You know, I don't know. <laughs> Um, well, like at, at our mom's house, there's a sculpture that both of us are like, what is this doing? And we've never shown it's the, you know, the Janelle, the sphere that is like yeah. crusted with objects. I think both of us are like, yeah. what is happening? But we're also so used to this idea of never throwing anything away that it's still in storage, even though we don't like it. Yeah. One of the things that Lisa and I um, are really interested in, instead of artworks becoming this, like, you know, when it's finished, it's fixed and it goes into storage and it's archived, um, we don't really think of our work like that. We think of our work as something that can just become new, kind of like a starter culture for a new piece, you know, like it's like sourdough or kombucha or something like that, where you can, like take a piece of it and then it can grow into something new and have this residue of, of a continuing conversation of a, of a thought that you had when you made it. Um, when it had its first iteration. And so oftentimes we will um, go through the work, you know, that's been in a show and we'll kind of mine it to make new works and pieces. So sometimes work that we really don't like becomes something that actually we, we really like in the future iteration of, of reusing a piece or a part um, of it. Um, and that I think is also kind of resisting this idea of an artwork um, being a kind of fixed commodity, you know, that, that it's um, something that's for sale and it's something that um, is this uh, kind of, that, that it is a kind of finalized thought and rather than something that's a kind of active growing um, thing that can, can morph and change. I think that question and how you responded that to that, Janelle, I think that we should totally use a mother in one of our next projects. Like the mother of kombucha is such a lumpy, shifty, fertile kind of material. Like maybe we should make some kombucha in our next show <laughs> and, and have some mothers hanging out, you know? The mother, yeah. Um, the, the another thing that that comment made me think of is this project that I was trying to convince Janelle to do for a long time where we would wear rooster. <laughs> trying to convince me to do that yeah you're still you where we would wear rooster rooster like hats and then get into a like a fisticuffs I like think I, I try to like let's see how much we can embarrass ourselves but sometimes we don't do these things we have a lot of outtakes from our performance uh projects that are um also done with photographs that we um you know we we have a kind of performative action that we document via photography and the pho photographs get shown that's not necessarily a live performance and i would say that we have a lot of outtakes um from from those as well yeah this question is also really interesting what kind of audience do you think you draw in the most with your work or is it all or is it kind of all over the place i think uh one of the things we've embraced with our collaborative work is that it can we've embraced the idea that it can be all over the place and so we've shown it at art fairs in a very kind of um you know kind of consumer driven collector driven uh gallery art world context we've shown it at university galleries which tend to be a more academic setting um and nonprofits. i think what both of us are really excited about showing it in kind of community-based nonprofits or, or um artist-run spaces spaces that are less commercially 
motivated and more motivated towards showing experimental work, but we've also um, shown them in, in the kind of commercial art world spaces as well. And we've also, you know, kind of made text pieces that that are um, that are functional sort of in, in print or in magazine kind of forms. Um, we've uh, yeah, I've been asked lately to like produce like virtual pieces for virtual exhibitions or digital works. And so um, I think one of the things we're interested in is whenever we get an opportunity to really consider what that particular audience is for that opportunity and how can we kind of um, uh, be be really conscious of that when we're just making the decisions about that particular body of work. And so like the show at um, Arizona State um, University Art Museum, very much you know aware that it's a university um, gallery, it's in Arizona, um, that we that there's a kind of educational component that's also um, a family friendly educational component that they were inter interested in us kind of interacting with as well um, was part of that exhibition and then also thinking about the timing in terms of it being 2017 and Trump being left in 2016 and having this conversation around um, you know activism resistance the border wall etc as well um, during that particular time um, and also Arizona being uh, um, considered you know pr a pretty conservative place um, relative to the place where, where we're from as well and so how to create a conversation that was an invitation to engage um, as much as possible for the audience that we knew were um, potentially going to see that exhibition. These are great questions everyone and I love all thanks for sharing all the love in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing everything, for being so generous. If someone has a burning question, oh, Anthony put up a little heart. That's sweet. Oh, all the little hearts pop it up. I love it. Uh, if love someone has a burning question, I'm like, I want to do too. Uh, <laughs> And one thing I think is important yeah. that we didn't know is that our mom doesn't consider herself an artist. Um, she grew up knitting uh, in Norway since she was about nine years old. She grew up in a community where she skied to school. They got electricity, I think, when you know when she was like nine or ten as well. Um, and and was in a community where everything was hand. So many things were handmade. Um, but the way that we grew up in Queens, she was an elementary school teacher. She was in school and then she was an elementary school teacher. And so she um, she she knit and so sewed and mended things for us as a family but it was really only until um she was in retirement that she took up knitting again and um and it was also after our father passed that we realized that knitting was this really amazing um process and tool for both her collective healing and as a way for us to come together um, and um, kind of create a project where we learned more about each other and had conversations about uh, about labor, about um, feminism, about value, about um, aesthetics, about um, all these different possible things that um, would be a kind of new chapter for us as a family to come together around. Um, so we often think of the works with our mom. Lisa, I like when you call it a love letter to our mom, um, which we think of a lot of these, these installations and, and projects as. Well, thank you so much. This is really amazing. Thanks for having us. Thanks Rachel. for having us. Yeah, I wish we could really be together in person, but at least we're here in this yeah. space. So. Yeah. And I really look forward to um, meeting some of you on Monday for um, our experimental drawing workshop. I put on I put down some materials that I shared with um, with Rachel, but really don't don't feel if you don't have some of that stuff, don't even worry about it. We're just gonna hang out and like share, do skill shares and like talk about what happens when we throw stuff at stuff and it's gonna be fun. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks for signing in everybody. Thanks for joining us.